your Bibles out and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Find your way to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Hit me a little bit more with the monitors. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18, the Bible says for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after the, after the wisdom of God, the, uh, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse number 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks require after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greek it's foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men and the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. Today I want to continue on the message of the cross. Let us pray. Father in the name of Jesus, I ask that mighty God you may use me to speak your word. Somebody is watching me by television that needs a word. Somebody is here under the sound of my voice that needs a word. I pray that your word shall go forth with power and revelation. I ask that God of heaven in the name of Jesus, indeed you shall use my lips of clay to speak the truth that comes from the word of God. Indeed, facts may be contradictory, but the truth will always stand. And the Bible says, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Indeed, you say, when the Son of Man sets you free, you shall be free indeed. And therefore today, I decree freedom is coming to somebody's home in Jesus' name. And somebody said a good amen. You may be seated today. One of the most contentious messages in our day is a message of the cross. The message of the cross is one of the most contentious messages in our day. Many people in our generation have struggled with the message of the cross. Paul, Paul writing in the book of 1 Corinthians says, But the preaching of the cross to the Jews was a stumbling block, and to the Greek it was foolishness. People throughout the ages have asked why God would require a sacrifice in order to restore his own creation. They have asked why God required the shedding of blood of his own son so that his wrath can be averted. It doesn't make sense why God would require a bloody sacrifice coming from his own begotten son. It doesn't make sense. The preaching of the cross is foolishness. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce to somebody here today that the preaching of the cross is the guarantee that the devil will never require and make any claim about your life or about that which concerns you. The cross is a guarantee that there will never be a demand that is put on you because Jesus has already finished the work. Now the Bible says for the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. And then the Bible continues saying that I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the wisdom of the prudent. Why? Because ladies and gentlemen, the, the cross is the wisdom of God. I want to write that down. The cross is the wisdom of God. The cross is the wisdom of God. The cross is the wisdom of God. What do I mean by that? I mean that when you see the cross, even though it doesn't make sense to a carnal mind, it doesn't make sense to a theological mind, it doesn't make sense to your thinking, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me, the cross is the wisdom of God. What do I mean by the wisdom of God? Write this down. Wisdom of God means it is the way God does what he does. The wisdom of God means that it is a way that God does what he does. The wisdom of God many times is contrary and contradictory to the wisdom of man. Because the wisdom of man does not many times line up with the wisdom of God. Let me give you an example. The wisdom of God says give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. That 
that is a wisdom of God. But many people don't understand how can my giving make God give? Shouldn't I be getting for me to be able to have? But ladies and gentlemen, the wisdom of God says give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. The wisdom of God says that you should pray for those who use you, uh, who despitefully use you. Those who are, are, are use you dis uh, uh, in a wrong way. The Bible says that you should, you should actually pray for them. That is the wisdom of God. It doesn't make sense. The wisdom of God says that you should honor those who are in authority. But in, the, in, the, in, the, in many uh, societies and in many cultures, uh, may, instead of honoring those who are, in society, uh, who are in leadership, we challenge them and we try uh, to rebel against them, against them. So the preaching of the cross many times is foolishness to those who are perishing because it doesn't make sense why God would require his son to hang on the cross to shed his blood so that there can be forgiveness of sin. It doesn't make sense why God, uh, the merciful God, would not just forgive you. Why would he require that his son would be a sacrifice for your forgiveness. It doesn't make sense. If it's forgiveness, just forgive. In fact, God says forgive. In fact, he says forgive 70, 70, uh, 70 times 7, uh, uh, 70 times 7 times a day. Uh, and why would God uh, institute that kind, of a, uh, that kind of a law and yet he himself uh, would require a sacrifice? Ladies and gentlemen, it is the wisdom of God. You know why? Because every time you see the cross, it is an answer and a guarantee that there is nothing the devil would ever put as a stumbling block for you to ever receive the blessing of God. The cross is an answer. It is a guarantee. It is a title deed. The effect of ensuring that whatever it is that you need from God, the devil cannot be able to stand against you. Against you. The cross, therefore, becomes, uh, becomes uh, uh, the pathway into your blessing, the pathway into your breakthrough, the pathway into a relationship. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, it's important for you to understand that human wisdom, when you look at people like opera and, and some of these guys, they're preaching human wisdom, a secular human, a humanistic wisdom uh, that tries to show you that all of us are okay. In fact, one of the uh, one of the things that is going around right now is spirituality that focuses on 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 uh, harnessing your your inner energy and and your inner self and and and, uh, and also uh, you know having the uh, thinking about the third eye and and, and spiritualism that does not uh, line up with the word of God. You know the reason reason why most of these people struggle uh, with, the, with the preaching of the, of the gospel is because of the bloody cross. The Christianity is too bloody. How can there be a black cross? How can the shed uh, a human being uh, be, be crucified on the cross? In fact, not a human being, but fully human and fully God. It, it doesn't make sense to them. But ladies and gentlemen, let me say this, that the wisdom of the world does not measure up with the wisdom of God. Can somebody say amen? So whatever it looks like foolishness, it is not foolishness. It is the wisdom of God. Somebody the wisdom of God. And I'm going to show you in a little bit here what I mean by that. Now, let, let's look at, at a few things that the cross did for us. Uh, number one, I want you to understand that the cross is a place where God's unfathomable promise intersects, intersects with our deepest need, with our deepest, most basic need, fixing our shattered lives. Let me say that again. The cross is a place where God's unfathomable promise intersects with our deepest, most basic need, fixing our shattered life. That is to say, the cross is a place where your life is completely, uh, uh, is completely fixed. The cross is a place where God meets with you and fixes your life. At the cross, he demonstrated his love. As his back was brutally beaten, Jesus demonstrated his love. When his back was brutally beaten, until his skin at the back was like, a, uh, it had gone through a shredder, uh, a shredder. The crown of thorns was forced on his head. He was mocked and scorned by Roman soldiers who he had created his, with his own hands. His beard was pulled and he was spat, he was spat on like a stick King garbage. He never opened his mouth. In fact, the Bible says he was led to the slaughter like a lamb. The cross therefore became the place of the demonstration of the love of God. It was the place where God demonstrated his love for you and I. Jesus did not hire for himself an advocate. He did not defend himself against false accusation. His disciples decided him. His own disciple betrayed him. His 
body was broken. His blood was poured. And his life was taken. Because he loved you. He endured the shame of the cross. The Bible says he endured the cross. And despised the shame. Therefore the cross. And I wanted to write this down. Was the exhibition. The manifestation. And the display of God's love. Let me say that again. The cross was the exhibition. Was the manifestation. And was the display of God's love. You don't have to. If you don't. If, you, you don't need to look farther. If you just look at the cross. You will be able to see. The, the love of God. Ladies and gentlemen. You must be persuaded. That God loves you. When you look at the cross. If there is nothing else. That will tell you of the love of God. When you look at the cross. The cross should be able to display to you. And tell you of the love of God. Jesus did not need to die. He died because you need. You needed salvation. And therefore ladies and gentlemen. The cross is a demonstration. It is the display. The manifestation of the love of God. He loves you in the midnight hour. He loves you when the sunrise is going down. He loves you when you mess up. He loves you when you have no hope. He loves you when everybody walks out of your life. He loves you when you mess up at night. He loves you when you're in the nightclub. He doesn't even wait for you to be nice. He doesn't wait for you to make your hair or to know how to look good. That's what the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. The Bible says that God commands his love towards us. He demonstrates his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Most people would love us when we look all together. Most people will like us when we our hair is in place. Most people will like us, Pastor Francis, when we can speak a good English and we can be able to hold our stance and together. But while you are still messed up, while you are still drinking mongari, while you are still prostituting, while you are still fornicating, and doing all manner of things. Jesus died on the cross because he loves you. Touch your neighbor, tell your neighbor, he loves you. He loves you when you fail. He loves you when you succeed. He loves you whether you have no degree. He loves you whether everybody has walked out of your life. He loves you whether you're Kisi, whether you're Kalenjin or Maragori. He loves you whether you have one wife, two wives or ten wives. He just loves you the way you are and guess what? Not only did he love you, but he demonstrated his love by dying on the cross. You are loved of God. I said you are loved of God. I said you are loved of God. I said you are loved of God. Lift up your right hand and say I'm loved. If nobody has told you I love you. You know some of us we, we are told I love you every morning. Three times a day. Morning, noon and night. It's like medicine. If nobody has told you they love you. The cross says Love you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Mwah. Somebody say I'm loved. <laughs> uh, somebody say amen. Number two. The second thing we see from the cross. The cross of Calvary is a place where God's ultimate triumph over the devil is completely and absolutely attained confirmed and declared. Let me say that again. The cross is a place where God's ultimate triumph over the devil is completely attained, confirmed, and declared. Colossians 2 and verse 15. The Bible says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. One thing you have to understand is that the cross, the devil tried to use the cross to humiliate Jesus. And he thought by hanging the son of God on the cross, he thought that he was triumphing. But the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, for if they had known, if the devil had known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Ladies and gentlemen, I came to tell you that at the cross, your victory was attained, confirmed, and completely declared. And there is nothing the devil can do about it. The Bible says, having spoiled principalities, he made an open show 
of them, triumphing over them. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was victorious on the cross. And that victory belongs to you. Put your hand on your chest and say, I am victorious because Jesus won the victory for me. Number three, the cross was the payment post. The cross was the payment post that the sacrificial lamb was offered on so that he can make payment of humanity's sin. The cross was the payment post where the Son of God hanging between heaven and earth paid for the sin of humanity. So ladies and gentlemen, there is no demand for you to pay for anything. The price has been paid. And guess what? The price was satisfactory, acceptable, and received. And the wrath of God towards you has completely been averted. Isn't that wonderful? You see, the reason why I love Christianity and the reason why I love the faith that I am in is because I don't have to do anything. Let me say that again. I don't have to do anything. All I need to do is only believe. And by faith in the finished work at the cross, <laughs> all my issues have been sorted out. And one of the reasons why people have a problem with the cross is because the cross nullifies their work. And so because their works are not needed, they feel as if God has not done them fairly because of their pride. They want to do something to be able to receive this thing. But let me tell you this. Christianity is not about your work. It is about Christ finishing the work on your behalf. All you need to do is only believe. If you can believe, you will be saved. If you can believe, you will be healed. If you can believe, you will be delivered. If you can believe, your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And there is no preacher that needs to confirm for you whether your name is there. By faith. Somebody shout faith. By faith, my name is there. By faith, I have a mansion in heaven. All you need to do is to believe. Somebody say amen. Number four, the cross. Number four is, is where bankrupt, fallen conscious of, of a fallen race. Listen to this. The cross is where fallen conscious of a fallen race experience the transformative power of God. What am I saying? The cross is not just for you and I. But if nations, cultures, people groups can come and humble themselves at the cross, the cross has the power to transform nations, to transform cultures, to transform people groups. If a nation turns their heart towards the cross and the Christ of the cross, I promise you, those nations, that nation will receive a transformation. Today, that was the introduction. Now, let me get into the body. Today, I want to focus on what price was paid for you. Because ladies and gentlemen, if the price has been paid, what are you doing paying the price? I'm going to give you seven things that Christ paid the price for. Somebody say seven. Everybody say one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven. Now, there could even be more, but I'm just going to give you seven. Now, if I take you to Hennessy's Hotel, let me use Hennessy's Hotel because they support us. If I take you to Hennessy's Hotel and, 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 and I, say, I say, I'm going into a meeting, but I wanted to go to the, cafe, uh, uh, to the, to the dining room. And when I go to the dining room, uh, uh, I want you to eat whatever you want. Don't worry about paying. I'm going to the meeting. I'll come and pay. In fact, I'm not going to come and pay, but I've already left money in the reception. All you need to do is to eat. They will deduct from the money that I've left in the reception. Now, if you go to the dining room and order for soup, and then eat soup with bread, you know those cones? And you eat soup with cones and walk out and leave. Now, whose fault is it that you did not eat the chapati and the lobster and the crab and the steak and then on top of that, the ice cream and the cake? Whose fault is it? Is it my fault? No, the fault is yours. Why? Because all you did was ask for soup. Ladies and gentlemen, in the kingdom of God, I don't want soup. I said, I don't want soup, but I want the salad. I want the cake. I want the steak. Uh, come on, somebody. I want the pork ribs. I want the chicken wings. I know you're getting hungry. I, I, I want the chapati. I want the ugali. Is there somebody listening to me? I want the whole package. If Jesus has paid the price for it, devil, you can't keep my money. You can't keep my children. You can't keep my joy. You can't keep my peace. You uh, Somebody ought to lift up the hand and say, I want it all. I, touch anybody, but I want it all. So when you see me blessed, don't get upset because I'm blessed. Don't get upset because I'm living good. Don't get upset because I'm having a good time with my wife. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, the same God that has blessed me, he is able to bless you. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I want it all. I want it all. I want the joy of the Lord. I want the peace of God. I want, I tell you, I want the steak. I may not know how to cut the steak, but I'm going to take the steak on the right hand and the ugali on the left hand. When you find me eating in the kingdom, don't get upset. Jesus has paid the price for it. I'm getting my deliverance. I'm getting my breakthrough. I'm getting my money. I'm, ah, somebody said, yeah, I'm getting my joy. Hey, give your neighbor a high five and tell them, hey, the price has been paid. All you need to do is to believe. Only believe your salvation is tied to your faith. Jesus went on the cross to pay it for you. Somebody say amen. amen. What is the first thing he paid the price for? Write this down. He paid the price for our sinfulness with the price of his righteousness. He paid the price for our sinfulness with the price of his righteousness. The Bible says in the book of First Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. The Bible says he was made. He, was, he, he made him who knew no sin to be seen so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus knew no sin. He was made to be seen so that we who are sinners can be made to become the righteousness of God. What is righteousness? Write this down. To be righteous means to have a right standing before God. To be righteous means to have a right standing before God. So when you come before God, he doesn't look at you based on your mess, based on your sin, based on what you did, based on the abortion you procured, based on where you've been. When you come before God, he clothes you with his righteousness. And when he looks at you, he sees that you just the same way he sees his son Jesus. Hey! The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 4, chapter 5, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. That is chapter 5, verse 6. And then the Bible says, verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. They say, For a good man, Maybe somebody, I don't know, me, I wouldn't die for nobody. I'm not dying for nobody. I said, I got no time for this. I'm not dying for nobody. But listen to this. The Bible says, 
Yet Jesus, while we were yet sinners, hey, he did not wait for you to be fixed up. While you are still messed up. Mm. While you're still messed up. You know, you know there are people who like you because now you smell nice. You put on cologne. You know how to walk now. You, you can swing from Cape Town to Cairo. So now they like you because everything is in place. But Jesus, while you are still dying in the disco and messing around and with dreadlocks in your head and smoking ganja and smoking weed, while you are still messed up, Jesus died on the cross for you. How uh, God on heaven. I wish somebody would just celebrate God for loving us when nobody would love us. Somebody shout, give God a praise right there. Number two, he paid for our shame with the price of his glory. He paid for your shame with the price of his glory. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, In Isaiah chapter 53, he was despised and rejected of men. Verse 3. A man of sorrows and acquitted with grief. And we hid our faces as we are. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Why was he being put to shame? So that you and I will never be put to shame. So ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. It doesn't matter the mess you have done. The shame and the reproach, the rejection and the despised, despisation, whatever. Is that a word? Whatever. That one has been rolled away. And where there was shame, there is honor. Where there was rejection, there is glory. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. Don't you ever let the remind you of your shame your shame has been rolled away and today you have the glory of God you in fact are the walking talking glory of God when you walk down Kenyatta Avenue when you walk down Moi Avenue do you know what the heaven says have you seen my son Nanga? have you seen the way he looks glorious have you seen ladies and gentlemen that's why I came to tell you you are the glory of God walking on the face of the earth don't you let the devil remind you of where you're coming from from when he reminds you of your past tell him of his future his future is the burning hell that is waiting for you but as for you because of Jesus your shame has been rolled away somebody say amen, amen. number three he paid for every curse with the price of his blessing I love to teach the word I, I love to teach the word because many tell let me tell you it's only the word that can set you free Hallelujah. Not laying on hands. If there is laying on of hands without the word, it's empty hands on an empty head. What we need is a word. My faith is built on nothing but the word of God. Somebody say amen. He paid for every curse with the blessing. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter number 1. Because you know, in, in Genesis chapter number 1 verse 28, God had initially blessed Adam. The Bible says and God blessed them and, and told them go and multiply. And he told them have dominion, be fruitful, multiply. Have dominion over the, over, over the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea and so forth. You know Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. But when Adam sinned, the curse came into operation. The curse came into operation when God said, when you sin, you shall surely die. What was he talking about? He was talking about the operation of the curse. Now, what is a curse? I want you to write this down. A curse is when you lack the power and the ability to succeed and to prosper. When you are under a curse, you don't prosper. You don't succeed. Everything you try collapses. You start a kiosk, it dies. You start a saloon, it collapses. You, you get a job, you're fired. Everything around you is just going down. And there's some people who are watching me uh, in the television and everything you touch uh, has not been prospering. But today I want to announce uh, that the blessing of God that 
maketh rich and addeth no sorrow is visiting your home, visiting your hotel, visiting your business, visiting your career. Next week, your boss shall favor you. There shall be the favor of God upon your life because the blessing of God is upon you. Lift up your hand and shout, I'm blessed and not cursed. Somebody say, I'm blessed and not cursed. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 3, write this down, Galatians 3, verse number 13. The Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Listen to that. The Bible says that Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? Because he was made a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is every man that hangs on the tree. Now look at verse 14 of Galatians 3. The Bible says that the blessing of Abraham, that the blessing of Abraham, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. We were exempted from the blessing of Abraham because we were Gentiles. But because Jesus hung on the tree and the Bible says that cast is a man that hangs on the tree. The blessing of Abraham became your blessing. So today, you don't need to sweat and to struggle to get blessed. I want to announce that in the name of Jesus, whatever you touch shall be blessed. Your family shall be blessed. Your marriage shall be blessed. Somebody say amen. I have to go quickly because I am running out of time. Number four, Jesus paid for our brokenness with the price of his healing. Jesus paid for our brokenness with the price of his healing. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 5 he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. Ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah begins to give an exposition of what will happen with the suffering Messiah and he says he will be wounded for your transgression. What is he talking about? He is talking that the suffering Messiah will be our substitute. He will be wounded for our transgression. He will be bruised for our infirmity. Our peace will be because of the chastisement upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. And therefore ladies and gentlemen, there is no sickness. There is no suffering. There is no pain. There is no demonic spirit, whether it's called diabetes or it's called high blood pressure. They can call it HIV. They can call it whatever they want. Jesus has already paid the price for your healing. When his back was beaten with the struggle, with the, it's called the cut of nine life. The whip of the Roman soldier is was because of your healing. And therefore today, if you're sick in your hospital bed, I want to announce that the healing power is coming where you are. Number five. He paid for our poverty with the price of his riches. He paid for our poverty with the price of his riches. And there are people who don't like to hear about prosperity. But I came to let you know that you cannot serve God and remain poor. Even if you begin there, there is going to be a factor of blessing. Because the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and added no sorrow. Let me give you a scripture. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 eight and verse nine. Second Corinthians eight nine. The Bible says for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he was made poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Ladies and gentlemen poverty is not your portion. Poverty is not your inheritance. Poverty is not what God desires for you. If you're watching me by television I want to tell you if you're in poverty and you begin to follow God it's only a matter of time before you say goodbye to poverty and I came to talk to the spirit of poverty to let you go so that you can become productive and you can walk in the abundance of God lift up your hand and say bye bye to poverty number six he paid for your rejection with the price of his acceptance he paid for your rejection with the price of his acceptance the Bible says in the book of Ephesians 2.13 Ephesians 2.13 I love this scripture I wish I had time to preach because I feel a preaching coming on me the Bible says but now in Christ Jesus you who are sometimes afar off have been made nigh by 
by the blood of Jesus. Before Jesus died on the cross, you are an enemy of God. You are alienated from the covenant of Israel. You didn't have hope in the world. The Bible says that you are a stranger from the kingdom of God. There was nothing that would ever reconcile you to God. But the Bible says, but now. Somebody say, but now. I wish you tell a neighbor, but now. But now. I love what Paul says. He says, but now. You who are afar off have been made nigh by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling man to himself. The reason why God sent Jesus is so that he can reconcile us back to himself. Ladies and gentlemen, before Jesus died, there was a hunger in the heart of God for you and I to be in fellowship with him. And he kept looking forward to the death of his son on the cross so that you and I can be no longer strangers with God. That is why when I come to church, don't tell me to shut up. Don't tell me to keep quiet. Don't tell me not to dance. No, 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 no. There was a time when I was far away. Now that I'm near, wait a minute. I'm going to dance. I'm going to praise. I'm going to bless the Lord because now I'm no longer a stranger. Now I'm a child of the Most High God. Now I am forgiven. Now I'm loved of God. Now I'm blessed of God. And there is nothing the devil can do about it. I appear before God. When I appear before God, angels have to shut up. Angels have to keep quiet. Because angels have not been through what I've been through. But I went through it. But even after I went through it, I still come and praise God and dance and give God a hallelujah. You may not be in church, but right where you are, God is there. And you need to lift up your hands and give God a 30 seconds praise. Because now you are not a far off. Somebody say, I'm not far. Come on, shout it. I'm not far. Come on, somebody say, I'm not far. You may not be in church, but God is right where you are. He is right next to you. He is a friend that seeketh closer than a brother. When everybody else has left, God is still near you. When everybody else has rejected you, God is still there. All you need to do is to lift up your voice and say, Jesus, I need your help. And the moment you shout it, he shows up. I'm near to God. No wonder the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, let us therefore come. Come. When you come to God, listen, <laughs> and this is the thing, when you come to God, you don't need to remove your mini skirt. Shall we talk? Let, let, me, let me talk because there's some religious spirits that are listening to me. You don't need to change your hairstyle. Re, re, no, no, no. Just the way you are. Kneel before God. He says, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. The cross has given me access to God. And guess what? You don't need a preacher to be a mediator between you and God. There is this craziness. Even when people call, they say, or write to me emails and say, Bishop, pray for me so that God can do this for me because I know you are near to God. Let me help you. I am not near God more than you. In fact, you may be nearer to God more than me. Just because I carry a title of bishop is not what gives me access to God. It is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you don't need to wait for next week. You don't need to wait until you confess in the confessionary box. You don't need to go until you tell your priest all you did. No. Right where you are in the mess that you're in, you can come before God and he will hear your prayer. Somebody say access. Somebody say access. Ah, you know, you may want access to the bishop and not get it. You may want to come to my office and the protocol will not allow you. You'll have to fill a pink form, a blue form, a white form. See, brother Paul, before you finish, Brother Paul, there's Brother Mogo. Mogo Tarogama. Brother Mogo. Now, that is my protocol guy. And when he looks at you, he looks at you like Unenda Wapi. But God ha, doesn't have protocol. God doesn't have a secretary. God doesn't have somebody that you need to see. All you need is to call on the name of the Lord because you have access. Touch a little bit access. Why don't you lift up your hand and shout, Jesus? And 
Somebody sit down because I'm closing. Number seven. Somebody say seven. He paid the price for our death with the price of his life. He paid for your death with the price of his life. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, listen to this. It says, now if Christ is risen from the dead, he has become a fast fruit of them who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came, man which man? Jesus. Came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, all of us, uh, for in Adam all die. Even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Ladies and gentlemen, Christians don't die. Let me say that again, and I want to say it on television. Do I have the camera? Which camera? This one. I like this one. Christians don't die. What Christians do is that they transition. They transition from earth and step into glory. The same way a baby, when a baby is in the womb, they don't die to come to, the, to life. They transition from the womb. And suddenly they were sleeping there, eating from the mamas, whatever. And suddenly they come out and they transition and they go, ah! and suddenly they are alive. In fact, let me say this. When Christians die, they become more alive. I say when Christians die, they become more alive. Because now we enter into the spirit world. Where now we don't have the flesh and the body. You don't need a matatu. You don't need an airplane. Your body is glorified. All you need to do is to jump. And wherever you need from one corner of glory, you go to the next corner of glory. I came to let somebody know that the Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And Kaberere, the one who went to be the Lord last Sunday, he is not dead. He is not in Langata. No. Langata is the house that he used to live in. The guy, when the accident happened, guess what? Angels were waiting to transition him and to bring him to the next life. Ladies and gentlemen, you shall not die but shall transition and enter into glory. And guess what? The Bible says, give me some little music. Jesus said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if it was not so, I would have told you. He said, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you in glory. Oh, yeah. People get upset about the house that I live in. But compared to the house that Jesus is preparing for me, that is a kiosk that I live in. I came to let somebody know you have a mansion in glory. You have a mansion in glory. And very soon you shall be in that mansion. Jesus overcame death on our behalf. Somebody say, I will not die, but shall live eternally. Somebody say, Yeah. Can I tell you a little bit about that blessed glow glory? In that place, there is no city council. In that place, there is no Kidero waiting for your taxes. In that place, there is no Kakeyare. In that place, there is no Mongeke. In that place, there is no Ashabab. In that place, we shall be dancing with the angels. We shall be singing with the Lord. We shall be blessing the King of Glory. I wish somebody say, yeah, I am looking forward for the day. Not next week, but 50 years from now, when I shall be transitioned into that place. Somebody say, amen. Now can I close? The cross. Somebody say the cross. I want to close the cross. Somebody say the cross. Attention to my neighbor. He's preaching about the cross. The cross has paid the price for all of your issues. So now, let's go back to the restaurant. You went and had soup. And you walked out with soup only. And now you're sitting in your house. And your stomach is grumbling. And you're feeling upset. Wondering why did I only eat soup? 
And why didn't I go to the main course? Why didn't I go to the dessert? Why didn't I have some juyo, some juice? Why? It's because of your ignorance. It's because of your foolishness. It's because of feeling nice. You didn't want to get embarrassed. That's why you took a little bit. But I came to let the church know if Jesus has paid the price for it, I don't care what to think about this guy. I'm getting my peace and I'm getting it now. I'm getting my joy and I'm getting it now. I'm getting my money and I'm getting it now. I'm not waiting until next year for me to get healed. Right now, today, I receive my healing. I receive my breakthrough. I receive my lifting. Tell people and tell them I'm getting my blessing. I'm getting my breakthrough. The cross has paid the price for your stuff and when Jesus hung on the cross what did he say he said it is finished ladies and gentlemen you don't have to pay for something that has been paid for all you need to do is to believe to lift up your faith and grab a hold of what it is that you need you don't even need a preacher to lay hands on you you don't need a man of God to pray with you right there where you are right now in the name of Jesus as you lift up your voice may you receive your healing may you receive your breakthrough may you receive your peace I decree and declare whatever God has paid the price for you to get a hold of right now I decree is coming your way receive your breakthrough receive your promotion receive your lifting receive your breakthrough shout yes shout yes devil i serve you notice you're coming out of my house you're coming out of my children you're coming out of my joy you're coming out of my home jesus has paid the price for it give three people a high five and tell them i'm coming out I'm coming out, coming out of poverty, coming out of distress, coming out of discouragement. I am coming. So listen to me. If you're watching me by television, the price has been paid. All you need to do is by faith, lift up your hand, lift up your voice, wherever you are, you may be in your house, in a hotel room, in a hospital bed. Anything you need is available. All you need to do is to believe. If you can only believe, all things are possible to those who believe. Impossible is nothing and nothing is impossible. So may the Lord bless you. May he watch over you. May he keep you. If you're not born again, Say this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Wash me clean. Write me my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. From today, I'm saved. I'm born again. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, call the numbers on the screen. Somebody is waiting to talk to you. Once again, thank you so much, KTM. Thank you so much, John Monene. Thank you so much, Mr. Sholei. All of you guys have been wonderful. The production team, you are amazing. And hey, in JCC, we are praying for you. And we know that the best is here to come. We send you over to Dukuza. But whatever you do, remember, the cross has guaranteed that the price has been paid. And there is nothing the devil can put a demand for you to pay for. Because Jesus paid it on your behalf. God bless you. See you here on Sunday. <laughs>